Good morning, Rob. Welcome to another episode of Laneway Talks. How are you today? I'm good, Vince. How are you? I'm good. I'm good this week. So uh, what do you got for us this week? Um, well, I've been pretty busy. I mean, last week um, I had a birthday, so um, I had a bit of a break last week because there was a family thing to do. But... Oh, happy birthday. Thank you very much. 64 years young. It's a bit scary, but... Um, you know, yeah, well, I'll be following that. you shortly. I'm only <clears throat> about six months behind. Oh, okay, beauty. All right. All right. Okay, what do we... St- yep. The Beatles wrote a song about it, didn't they? Not 64, and they yeah. also wrote another one for me called Dr. Robert. So, you know, that's really, really good. Um, I'm just making sure my camera's picking everything up. It's a different view today, so thanks for the new camera. I really appreciate that. All right. Um, all right, so... This is episode 30 by my calculations, and for the new season, it's episode 7. Would that be correct? That would be correct. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we've been working, I sent you some new artwork for the Another Way single by the Virgin Soldiers. Well, you get that? I better, yeah, yeah, I better write that down. Um, yep. I'm, uh, I'm running so behind, so uh, Virgin... Okay. Soldiers, another yep. way, another yep. way. Okay, sorry, I've got that many releases. I'm having to do it the old way, right? <laughs> right at yep. so I don't uh, miss it. Okay, yeah. So what yeah, do we got there? What do we got happening? Yeah, well, Blake Shepard's finished the artwork for that, and that's um, it's a good concept. It's a, a heart being torn out by a demon. So, but um, yeah, yeah, I was stoked when. She sent it through the other night, and I went, "Wow, that's great!" Because we've got the film clip that you you guys are doing, um, yep. bringing that up. Yep. Um, well, I'm not sure when that release is going to happen, but later in the year, hopefully yep. before Christmas. Yeah, I would hope before Christmas. It'll be at least yeah, all of November. Still working on it. Okay. I got I got another I don't know ten second um, snippet of it because it just works in the, because it's animation. It's really slow. Yep. Yeah, that'd be great to check that out and get that out. Um, the other one is we're working on a like a moving art model for the Power Hungry video because the Power Hungry video is nearly done as well, but we've got some extra graphics going in there, so it's a bit more entertaining. So that's mm-hmm. exciting as well. Good. Um, but it all takes time to do. Um, and my YouTube shorts I wanted to talk about this week as well. Um, I've got a lot happening with that, um, up to 130 subscribers, um, which is an increase of 60 subscribers over about three and a half months. Because yeah. um, I've been doing the shorts every couple of days. So, and the most popular one that I put up last week got 4.3 thousand views so, that's fantastic um, rob i mean you know now you're talking you're really that you're really starting to move ahead and i you know yeah. some people will say 130 is nothing but you know nothing starts you know big as such it takes time and persistence and you and me keep ramming it home for artists yeah. it's yeah, consistency yeah. and consistency and persistence and it's you know that next time we talk it may be 230 or 330 and off it goes. So that's great. Yeah, it keeps going up, you know, by four or five a week um, as I keep putting them up. Uh, but I was really – it's interesting because the different topics that I put up – and it's all drumming, of course, um, but the, the Virgin Soldiers clips that I put up, the highest one I think we've got there is 1.2, like 1,200 views. Yeah. Um, which is the intro to Never Too Late, which is I, one of my favourite bits. Um, spent a lot of time working on that and working that out. Uh, Never Too Late's a great song too, I think. It's mm. in my book. It took me about two years, I think, to transcribe that. Believe it or not, people. It's but, a uh, long I, time, mate, and a lot of hard work. Yeah, well, I mean, in that process, uh, a lot of people, because I sell my book, I sell a lot of my copies of my book, which I'm, hey, look at that, uh, foundation. Um, I sell it through the shop, but the thing what I did, the concept of that, and there's, if you can see that, make it change, beautiful. Um, Never Too Late's the other one. I recorded all those albums. I didn't think about what I was playing. Um, a lot of notes there. Other than 
working with the guitar player with Jeff and with Chris. Yeah. About the structure of those songs, but we always like to play a lot of notes. Um, and then coming back to it, as I said, I always wanted to transcribe what I did. So the second half of my book, there's half a dozen transcriptions of Virgin Soldier songs in there. So um, when I have a look at how many notes it takes, but it takes a long time to transcribe uh, people. It's, I would suggest that uh, if there's any drummers out there listening, mm. um, practice writing out what you're playing, what your ideas are. Just do it in small chunks at first. You know, like write out what the groove is. Have a look whether it's, you know, eighth note groove, eighth note triplet groove, sixteenth note groove, combination of both. It's really good to write that out and actually see it. Um, it helps you get a better understanding uh, at a deeper level of what you're doing and what you're playing. But anyway, yeah, so that I want to go into that in more depth on my YouTube channel as well. Yeah. Um, and I did notice every clip that I've done, and I've done 48 shorts in just, I think it's just under four months, 48 shorts. Every one of those shorts I've transcribed and it's from a written, arranged piece of music. Now, do you know what arranged is, Vince? Uh, yes, word? yes, I do. I do, yeah. yeah. What's your understanding of that? Well, arrangements would be the, the I put it down to the sectors of the song or sections of the song and how everything's interacting. And would I be correct there in saying so? Therefore, you've got the drums, you've got the guitar, you've got everything in how it actually interacts, becomes the arrangement. Yeah, it's, um, that's one sense of the word. Mm. Um, for me, it's a little bit more technical in an understanding. Like when you go up and jam with a song, you're just thinking about playing the song, when you're, whether you're behind the kid on guitar or you're singing, right? Yeah. Uh, now, an arrangement is like a formal, written-out version of it. Yeah. It's like, okay, we've got the introduction, I'm going to write that out, and I'm going to see it, and it's going to be written, written in stone, pretty much. Mm. So, And then you've got your introduction, you've got your verse, maybe, or sometimes people start with a chorus, whatever you songwriting style is or your approach is. Mm. Um, but when I'm talking about transcription, the arrangement is it's written out, you can read it, and you stick to it. Right. Right? So it's a discipline that you use. I mean, Rush, And it is a discipline. It is a discipline. There's no doubt. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's an important part of improving as a player, having that depth of understanding. I just yeah. mentioned Rush before. Neil Peart was probably the greatest at doing those sort of breakdowns to just hold up here taking center stage is something that I've worked through um, it's a DVD that he did it's three DVDs it's seven hours of yes I have I have that in an unopened package Rob <laughs> yeah well that that's <laughs> <laughs> I've got the book as well there's a book I'm reading I think I think well. look I got to tell you honestly I think we put it out <laughs> That's that's why I've got it in the unopened package. It's the Hudson Music. Uh the D V D. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We would have we would have licensed it for Australia and we would have released it here. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Godfather Neil, fantastic. Um, I love his work. I've got so much of his written work, transcribed work, his books. Um, I study him. Intently, I teach a lot of his disciplines and arrangements and things to my students because I think for an example of what I'm talking about, he is definitely the one that's at the top of that game. Um, as far as understanding the instrument, wanting to get better continually up until basically he gave up playing um, because his body sort of wouldn't do what he wanted to do. But, yeah, I, I really like that approach and it really inspires me and that's why I kind of do what I do to try and keep up that tradition of writing out what you're doing and keep improving, keep understanding and, um, you know, write, helps write better music. I do that with all my solo stuff too, with my guitar playing, yeah. my singing, write out all those arrangements. So when the guys come in in my band, I can hand them the sheet music and then we can work from there so you've got an arrangement which is back to the original well that comes down to can they read music so if they all can that's great isn't it yeah i they they can the, the people that i play with i kind of hand pick that they can do that i mean 
unlike the soldiers guys. Um, they don't read but per se, but they know the ins and outs of what they're doing. They can articulate it. Well, we, 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 you know, we could separate that, couldn't we, between the ones that um, read, sight read, and the ones that uh, are just feel-based, right? Yeah, sight, sight reading's a whole other ball game. That's um, having the ability to read, sit there and go, ah, oh, one and two and three and four and whatever. Yeah. Sight reading is go, count me in, bang, I'm playing it without even thinking about it. Yeah. That's the next level. That's the I often, I often level. put that. I was uh, at the theatre just recently, and uh, you know the drummer was there, and you know obviously it's all it's all in um, it's all been transcribed. It's all in sheet music, and there they are, sight reading every song. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I was um, a friend of mine in Melbourne, a great theatre drummer, a guy called Jeff Barnes. Oh yeah, uh, great jazz player. He invited me into the pit. He was doing hair. Um, he invited me into the pit to watch him do it, like sit next to him. And he's sitting there pointing to where he was in the music with his drumstick, you know, like going, oh, here we're here, we're yeah. here, we're here, we're here. Um, while he's talking to me, while he's playing the show, like with one hand and turning the pages of the music. And I'm sitting there with my jaw on the ground going, how the hell do you know where you are? <laughs> <laughs> It was the most, just the most glorious show of musicianship, um, and he was so relaxed about it and killer player. And the the, the show was fantastic. Hair's a really good production, um, you know, but he's done lots of lots of shows like that. You know, Ben Todd's another one who's amazing. He's back from Cirque du Soleil. He's doing that over here at the moment. I've just finished Hairspray, I think. Um, and they're big gigs. Yeah. You know, yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, there's lots of you know great players like that that can do that. It's a different style of drumming as well. Um, and yeah, very hard work. So No, it's good. All right, moving on. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is um, still on the kind of the Virgin Soldiers thing with um, what's happening with that. Um, we're kind of looking at trying to get something together to come over maybe early in the new year. Um, because I think we'd like to do a bit more promo on the couple of new singles we've got coming out. So yep. Talking with Gib and um, some of the boys on that. So, so we could know. possibly see some live shows from uh, <coughs> Virgin Soldiers. In the new year, yeah. Right. We're, we're getting a few. We're going to have to get a sub player for uh, the rhythm guitarist, Chris Farley's not very well at the moment. He's got health problems. So Sorry to hear you. that. Uh, yeah, it's, he's kind of like the engine room of the band. Um, yeah, that's a, a little bit tricky, that one. Well, but, you know, um, interestingly you say that. So, you know, when you look at the formulation of a band and when a band has, a, a, you know, some people go, it's just the rhythm guitarist. A good rhythm guitarist is the backbone of, of the whole rhythm section of the band. Yeah. It is very, I actually think it's very difficult to be a, a really hot rhythm guitarist. It it's a hard gig. A rhythm guitarist, yeah, it's just a rhythm guitarist. But a really hot rhythm guitarist really gives substance and uh, a solid sound to the band. It's um important section, I think. Yeah, I have grown up with really good rhythm guitar players. Um, I mean, I think Chris Farley's probably one of the best ones I've ever played with. Like, you know, the in the tradition of the Rob Riley's like the Tats, um, that style of player. Um, yeah. But yeah, Chris very much held it there. But I mean, you know, Jeff Marcus as well, um, they both interacted very well in like the two parts that they played. Like when you think of two guitar players, a rhythm guitar player and a lead guitar player, you know, even if you go back to status quo. Well, isn't that talk- interesting? I was just watching Rick. Status Quo last night, live show. Oh, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When well, you got Rick Parfitt and Frank Rossi, you know, like, um, I remember the first time I saw them, Apollo Stadium over here in Adelaide, I think it was 74, um, I don't know whether it was Pile Driver or what tour it was. It was just before On The Level came out, the year before that, because I saw them three years in a row. Their guitars, they came out and just, you know, hit a chord and your chest shook. Oh. I was half. 
And then the way that they interacted, there was these two rhythmic things going on. There's like the upbeat thing that Parfit played, like one and two, and three, and, and then Rossi's playing the downbeat thing. And when you interact that, you know, the, the syncopation that comes out that, you know, sort of moves you. And that is, um, I think that's very, very difficult to do in a, um, well, a there, musical. And to get are, it well. Yeah, well, they're a very rhythm-based band, aren't they? I mean, yeah, they're great lead guitarists because they can play great lead breaks and whatever. But they are yes. essentially a rhythm-based band. Yeah, well, they get they get you moving, you know. I mean, the whole crowd within 30 seconds was jumping up and down and yeah. pretty much for the whole gig. Um, you can feel it. Yeah. You know, I think that's what, you know, music is does that to a lot of people, you know. It speaks to you in a, in a physical sense, you know. Um, yeah. And um, I groove is a very important part of that. I mean, I'd like the... Well, I must say the, the, drumming, the drumming didn't excite me in that band at all. I was watching it last night and... Um, <clears throat> I was not excited was it, by the drumming. This was 1982. Was, was it still John Coughlin? No, I wouldn't know, mate. I was never... The really, in. really long straight hair and the mo. No, no, it wasn't. Short hair, this guy. And he had a no. full concert kit. No. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't... I know he must have been ringing because, you know, the show starts with a band coming in on a helicopter. Well, that's just the two guitarists and Alan and nobody else. So that means they're the core of the band. Everybody else is a paid musician. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I, I, mean, didn't, John, I didn't like his style, the guy, yeah. guy drumming. I love Johnny Coughlin, um, one of my favourite drummers, um, as I said, because I saw him uh, yeah. three times. Um, and just the way he played, how cool he was. And rhythmically, there's a lot of Tom stuff that's going on that he's doing. Um the intro to Just Take Me. I don't know whether you know that song. But no, I don't. No, I'm not I'm not a, no. a huge status quo fan, so yeah. I never yep. really listened to a lot of it. I, I kind of was all the way up to Blue For You, but I think that's where it finished for Coughlin. Um, and then, you know, the band sort of changed and because uh, Blue For You was a big album as well. Um, I mean, that you know, Roll Over, Lay Down. Was, well, Hello, uh, Hello would be their biggest album, wouldn't it? No, I think On The Level might be, actually. Right, okay. Down Down, because Down Down was, I think, their biggest song, wasn't it? Yeah, I suppose it would have been, you know. Yeah. We all know that song. Yeah, I mean, that was all over Countdown at that stage as well. So. Well, it's all over Coles, isn't it? But we know that that's all bull, <laughs> bullshies now. That that's not, yeah, but, not real. No, it's not. There you go. There's another trip, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Prices are down down after we increase them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Exactly right. Oh, so what else is going on? Oh, my, my hair's doing something weird. Um, got a friend of mine over here that I teach um, his daughter drums, and he works for Triple M over here. He mm -hmm. just was telling me about the Metallica tour that's just starting. So I just got more Metallica tickets, which is good. Well, it's just starting uh, here, is it, or overseas? Um, no, Metallica's coming here in November 2025. So right. Yeah. I think pre-sales have gone on, I don't know whether they've started yet, but anyway, yeah, um, looking forward to that. Last time I saw Metallica was at Festival Hall in Melbourne Yeah. For the, and Justice for All tour, um, and I tell you, that was a machine then. Well, it would have been because they were young. They're old guys now, so I don't think you're going to get the same energetic show, unfortunately. Yeah, just the way the production was and the way they worked and how the band, I mean, the show that it is now is phenomenal. Um, but I think it... Well, it would be. Plenty of money. It's more a visual and effect now, whereas the yeah. Festival Hawk show, I mean, you know, how many well, gigs have you been? Well, that, was, that would have been a musical show, and I agree with you. Now it would be more, more effects and whatever because they're older guys. They can't move as quick. Yeah. Um, you know, they're just not going to have the same energy. Uh, so it won't be, yeah, it won't be thinking Festival Hall, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, they're at Adelaide Oval here, so, you know, they're doing all the outdoor venues everywhere. So, um, well, you didn't have I to just, bid for your ticket, did you? No, I got it through the um, a friend of mine. Right, because <laughs> everybody else would have to bid, you know, this bidding process. Yeah, I, that's the uh, Live Nation, is that what they're called? 
oh, yeah, but that show was a beat-up on Live Nation. It wasn't real. I mean, don't, don't believe that. That show was just rubbish. No, but that, isn't that the, the booking agent? Well, no, that's Ticket Tech. They own Ticket Tech and the others own Ticketmaster. And you got, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, um, you know, no, the, the bidding process can be controlled by the band. When you do the contract, you could easily say, uh, as the artist, I don't want any of that going on. Tickets will be at this price. So you want a VIP ticket, it's going to cost you $750. Um, up front row or $1,000, and then general admission, well, they're $150 and there's no, no bidding, nothing. You could, you could specify that. So we don't, we don't want people to be fooled by TV shows, especially not the ABC, where yeah. there's, there's no reality in anything the ABC tells you. Um, and, uh, you know, that can all be contractually organised at the very beginning. So if they are having the bidding process, the band's in with them and they want it. I think it's disgusting, but, you know, that's my thing. Um, is, that, is that really how it works? That's ab- absolutely how it works. Absolutely. You've, you're in full control. As an artist on that level, you're in full control. Pearl Jam were the classic. Pearl Jam I never wanted to rip off art, their fans and... Um, look, I'm going back 20 years now, and when they were coming here, I remember, um, I think they were doing the Sydney My Music Bowl, and yeah. they restricted their ticket prices to $50 and $70, you know, 70 being your front row and $50 general admission. And, oh, yeah. uh, you know, because at the time they would have charged, I don't know, $95 or $85, and they restricted it, and they were in control. And you can be in control. So when I see those shows like that beat up on Live Nation, whether I like Live Nation or not, it was a beat up. And uh, you can control everything when you're an artist on that level doing those level of shows. You know, okay. um, on top of that, you could even be in control on lower levels too. Anyway, uh, you know, we don't want to – That it's a whole discussion in itself – it's about yeah. management. It's about the band being in control, the band mm-hmm. knowing what they want, not saying yeah. it's got nothing to do with them. Um, you know, there's integrity involved. It's about your fans. But when you allow that kind of, let's say, the bidding process to go, um, all it is is about money. You don't care about the fans anymore and you've moved to another stratosphere and, that then gets down to, to me, the breakup of society between the rich and the poor and the middle class being wrung out, you know, you know, squeezed out. And, um, and you know, you have to take control at some form. Um, as I say, if you squeeze out the middle class, you're looking for revolution. And um, we need to take control and say how much money is enough money, and artists need to do that too. And when they say they need to charge Joe's to cover all the costs, <clears throat> well, do you need to have, um, uh, you know, 10 semi-trailers worth of equipment to do the show? And, you know, they always say, oh, the next show's got to be bigger and better and better than the last artist. Does it have to be that? Or can it just be a, a great show? It doesn't have to be brilliant. And they're all the questions, aren't they, that come out with the money. So if I'm going to have some kind of amazing stage show and it's going to cost millions and then we've got to transport everywhere and, yeah, of course, tickets will have to cost more money. I remember going to see Prince, you know, and um, I saw Prince a couple of times, but the last time I saw Prince, only before he died, uh, and the show was just... Phenomenal, of course, because it was Prince. And this guy kind of improvising right throughout the whole show shows you how good a guitarist he was. But the the setup was just the stage. The drummer um, the drummer always fascinated me because he'd always have this big, fat, black dude who would just be unbelievable. And he used to cover his whole set with a glass, uh, you know, enclosure. Um, uh, and I, I don't know why they like, do that, Rob. Um, why do they do so- that? So they don't get bleed on stage from the drums, which goes into the instrument mics or it goes into the vocal right. mics or just to basically pull the volume down so the vocalist doesn't have to endure the pain of 
than suffering of a loud drum kit. Right. So you know, and that was that was the set. And you know, um, yeah, you know, of course, just a sellout in ten seconds. But uh, you know, there was no there was no big stage show. It was the band. It was about the artist. Yeah. Good lights, right? And lights do everything. Um, why can't it be like that? But then, you know, I suppose we see the Katy Perry show, and that's a cabaret show. I'm not sure we're talking here about quality music, are we? Because you've got the whole stage show, which is like a cabaret show. Yeah, I, not on my radar, any of that. It's there, not there you go. So, um, so you know, I... I <laughs> <clears throat> well, so th there you go down to ticket pricing and all, all that kind of jazz. You know, we have to be very careful. But, you know, today's world of misinformation, buy information mm. because of social media. But then yeah. you get the ABC who are, you know, talking a load of rot themselves. That's the old free to air. You, you know, they don't, you know, it's you've got to be very careful to try and weed out what's real and what's not real. You know, and if you beat up on Live Nation, what about the other companies here, AEG, TEG, and the rest of them? You didn't. There was no beat up there, so we beat up on one. Um, anyway, that that was that. You know, uh, yeah. I mean, I just for the Metallica tickets, the general admission is three hundred and thirty three dollars. That's out. That's outrageous, mate. I would refuse to pay that kind of money. That is At, outrageous. It is A reserve is three hundred and thirteen dollars, and B reserve is two hundred and thirty one dollars. Oh, two thirty one. There you go. So, I my personal opinion is, for general admission, one hundred and fifty dollars should be enough. That should be enough when you're doing ten thousand seaters, or if you're doing a stadium where you can have thirty thousand. You know. Well, Adelaide, Adelaide Oval, I think when ACDC were here, is like forty. 40,000 people, you know, uh, Why would you need to charge us? Look, it's all a money grab. It, look, we live in a capitalist society, and that's that. It doesn't matter whether you're in China, they're capitalists too. Um, and Russia, well, we know they're fascists. And so you, it's going to happen no matter where you're playing. <clears throat> they go for the, the biggest buck. But look, I'm anyway, that's my opinion on it, is it's trying to deliver for your core audience and you're ripping them financially, you know, when cost of living crisis is, is a killer now, and your average person is your average punter, follower. It's not just all rich people, you know. It's across, I would suspect, it would be middle class and down. It'll be the rich, but uh, yeah. more the others. But anyway, um, <clears throat> that's that. Uh, few, yeah, I thought it was uh, a ridiculous amount of money. It is ridiculous, and it's, um, it's not... I refused... I'll ref well, I suppose I've never – that's terrible, isn't it? I've never paid for a gig in my life, I don't think, because, uh, you know, because you know people, you, you can get in. But, um, but you know, uh, it's just – it's another world in music. We have bands not being paid, everybody out there. You don't get paid from Spotify because if you don't have a 1,000 listeners or a 1,000 streams uh, – you don't get any income. The rest of them get your income for bringing people to that side. Uh, we have shows which are outrageously expensive. Yeah. Uh, merchandise which has just gone through the roof. So a T-shirt now is $70. Uh, you know, it just it's incredible what's going on. One way mm. of pulling that back is, I want, you know, I need everybody to support Laneway Red. We are growing and we are growing. And Laneway Red at the moment... Um, we're still you know, introducing people to it. We will be for the next 12 months, even 18 months. Um, but we can see our numbers growing. And what we're trying to establish is an environment for musicians where you'll be paid on a fair basis. At the moment, you know, we make no bones about it. We're building it and it's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's populated by all the laneway music artists and um, streaming we're not paying anybody because we're not paying. That We're funding the whole thing at the moment. And mm -hmm. downloads, yes, the artist gets 85%, but our, as I said to someone yesterday, downloads will be gone within the next couple of years, I mean, realistically. So it's all about advertising and then sharing. So how, 
in that 50-50 with the artist, which we will hopefully start to do in about a year's time. So it's just getting paid per stream? Yes, yeah, so what, what we're proposing is that, um, um, I always use the example, if you have a, uh, uh, an advertisement top and tail on your audio stream and say that costs the advertiser one cent, I'll just use that as an example, one cent, that's a 50-50 um, participation rate with us and the artists, so they get 0.5%, we get 0.5%. Um, and that is, you know, someone said to me, really that low? And I said, that is a hundred times better or a thousand times better than you'll get through Spotify. That's for sure. Uh, and through any other platform. So, you know, it still gets down to that question, how much money is enough money? So if your organisation is built on whether you have merchant bankers involved and therefore you have to bring back your KPIs are set high to bring a return on investment, you, you yep. know, you're all about ripping and that's what it's going to be about. There is no other way because they all look for their double-digit growth, which to me is an unsustainable growth. Um, but what but it really... Yeah. I don't know. It just turns... I suppose music's always had that side of it, but it just turns music into a commodity yeah. to, or to advertisers. Exactly. Well, it does. So therefore, what we're the, trying the, to do is to make sure that the musician can make an honest dollar from their creative works. You don't know how many times I get asked... Can we use this song? And I go, well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to cost that out for you. And they go, no, no, we can't afford to pay anything, but you'll get some, you know, the marketing out of it because, you know, it's either a big show or it's a big something else. And I go, no, the artist wrote the song because he wants to make money out of it or she wants to make money out of it. And therefore we have to charge you for that copyright. You can't get it for free. So... Um, you know, this is a constant battle. It is about those creative works are worth money. People do it to earn a living. And you're right, people try and cheapen it all the time as if it's a free commodity, that, you know, the music is just free. It's, well, hold on, it's just free, and that's that. Anybody can write music, Rob, can't they? No. No, no, no that's right. Oh, no, let me rephrase that. Anybody can write what is perceived as music, but not everybody can write what is perceived as good music. Yeah, exactly. But that's it's all subjective. Um, people are brainwashed into what they think they like now anyway. So, Well, I'll, I'll contravene that with saying that doesn't mean that the person writing the good music is a good musician because that doesn't count. But that, it's subjective. They could be a bad musician but still write a really good song, what you perceive to be a really good song. Um, but that's what, that's what I mean. It's all yeah. about perspective. What do you yeah. perceive as in your world of um, Vinstam as a good song? You, know, it's, it, you would have different things that you respond to that I would say yeah. if we just keep it between the two of us. You can't really yeah. talk about anybody else's life. But, um, and I think that's the... The tragic thing that people are starting to lose themselves and what they really respond to for the sake of it being consumerist commodity and things that they're trained into being addicted to. You know, it's like you come back to yourself, people. You know, what you like is what you like, not what somebody else tells you that you like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, we're getting a lot of really good statistics on Laneway Red, and they are. Uh, we've been working on reports for the last month, you know, on a lot of different reports. As we read reports, we go, but we want one that does this, you know. And, you know, what we do know is very clearly with our stats is that we can drill down and we can correlate everything from the original person that got a, uh, got a uh, media link uh, or a media share link to a yep. stream, to a country, to a city. We can get all of that. Of course, you don't get all of that on the other platforms because they only give you snippets of what they want to give you um, to try and get you to spend more. And I've said this before, to spend more. Yeah, uh, it's all about. Yeah, you know, it's th throwing mud at a wall and some sticks. Now, what we can see very clearly is we can target people. So as they become members... Um, you know, we can target them specifically. And that's what they're becoming members for, so that artists uh, who they, they like 
and the artist then can come back to them directly and tell them there's a new song out or tell them about special offers and whatever. Now, this is a really long process for us. This is, you know, I was, again, talking to someone last week about it. I said, realistically, it's a couple of years uh, where we'll be developing all this because it just doesn't come quickly and you've got to, you've got to gain the audience's um, participation rate through, um, through them trusting your site because in this world of uh, online fraud and criminal activity, you've got to be very careful. So we've got a long process of gaining people's trust and that our logo is trustworthy and real. We do promote it now everywhere as the Australian streaming site because we're not an app yet, we're a, we're a website and we will become an app, but that'll be late next year. And okay. so, you know, what we're doing here is growing organically, I think, um, you know, and we're getting people joining as artists from all around the world. Uh, but we're trying to do it organically so that there is real trust in the site. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but that it's um, it's a rock-solid kind of site. It's not just there and being propped up by a lot of money and uh, get on board, but it's the same as everything else. So <clears throat> um, it's very exciting times and looking at the t- t- the statistics. I, I tell you something that really amazed me in the last two weeks was that uh, uh, we, I uh, put up a post of um, oh, look a band in between um, ACDC and the Cult, and, and uh, <clears throat> that particular post went absolutely crazy. Now it had obviously it's got to be me mentioning those two kind of bands, uh, yeah. and that the singer was in between Ian Ashbury and Jim Morrison from The Doors and from the cult there. And again, so and it got a massive response. It kind of went crazy. And uh, I went, wow. Um, you know, because that, that is classic rock, essentially, what I've just mentioned. It's classic rock. And and I, I it was on sites where I don't think people would know a lot about us, Laneway Music, and therefore... Why Why would they kind of know? Whereas I think if I put a, a post up on Facebook, it's very clear. If I do a, pa- a Facebook on classic rock, I get a yeah, reasonable response. If I do a, a post on our Facebook on chain, say, and blues, we get massive response. So we know that blues, we have a large blues audience, blues rock, and or traditional Australian mm. blues. Um, so, you know, all those kind of stats really interesting to see, Rob, because it really does direct you. And I think, you know, when you think about your drumming site, when you get to that level, so I'm talking to you in two years' time and it's, you know, and it's really pumping, all those stats for you will make a huge difference in how you make a post. Mm, yeah, of course. So, you know, I'm a, a lot of At happening. the moment, it's, it's just, as I said, you know, my biggest post at the moment is a snare drum piece that I played with one of the guys from my drum line. Um, I, put, I mean, you know, like the most popular things that I put up are the snare drumming posts that I put up. Um, I, I don't, not sure why, whether it's just the audience that I get out to or people like that sort of drumming because it's the, the level of difficulty is quite high and um, I think the pieces we're playing are very challenging. Uh, but they sound great too. So, yeah. I mean, you know, on, on that note, you know, I've got my drum line playing and the pageant on the weekend we've been worked all year to get our rep up to play and march through the streets of Adelaide to over 300,000 people in a couple of days so you know Fanta- um, absolutely fantastic yeah we we'll always have a lot going on Rob um yeah yeah it's good it's so tell like me a- well tell me what's going on with because you know we because I had that from the last show that you were actually getting ready for the pageant you're having rehearsals yeah, yeah. and whatever and so that's happening. And what's going on with your Michael Hill project? Um, unfortunately, Michael's had a death in the family, so they've had funerals and all that sort of stuff to arrange. So yeah, condolences to Michael and yeah. family on that one. Condolences but, there. Yeah, thank you. Um, I know it's almost finished, but um, I haven't spoken to Michael for more than a couple of days. But I didn't want to press him. Yeah. Hey, what are you doing about your video? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
and want to be heartless in that. So yeah, I'll just let that unfold. But yeah, I know it's nearly, it's pretty much done. So we expect that in the next couple of weeks to be out. Okay, fantastic, absolutely. Yep. Um, yep. We've got a new Deep South song coming. It's just finished or finished yesterday. Um, so now we'll get on to making the video. So there'll be at least another two or three or four weeks. And um, so I would suspect that'll be out in late December. Um, uh, so that's another one there. And, uh, you know, a few of the a few of the things I read here, we've got um, new releases by Buzz and the Pickups, who are a young 20-year-old Buzz. band here in Melbourne. Yep, Buzz right. and the Pickups. We have yeah. a new La Femme album coming. Um, La Femme were an Australian punk band in 1980, yeah, 1980. Um, and Shane Chain, the singer, has had a lot of iterations, has recently last 15 years been with City Sharps, um, yeah. Sharpie yeah. band, and now he's got a new La Femme album coming out. Um, we have a new yep. New Age album coming, which New Age is the was the bass player from Teenage Radio Stars and then La Femme. And... We have a new Charlie Marshall song coming out, which he has with his band fam or his son, Family Affair, just the two of them. Um, and we also have right now that's come out uh, in the last week is Uppercut, which is a couple of the guys from City Sharps and uh, their new singer, an Italian singer, and uh, and that's a, a just a, a really good hard rock song. And there's a um, whole album there, but. That'll come out over the next six months. Sure. And so we're promoting that at the moment. Um, and also, you know, there's a new Mississippi Shakedown coming, I think, next Friday, Friday week. Uh, and we've just finished the video for that. So there's a lot of product coming. Oh, and there's a new Remora song coming. And some statistics, actually, because I had a meeting with Remora yesterday, and some stats there that, were kind of interesting to me that on um, on Spotify and the Remora uh, is uh, the drummer from James Freud and Berlin back in 1982 or whatever, um, okay. and uh, and uh, a, uh, was a singer who's now contracted Parkinson's disease, so <coughs> he's not oh, singing yeah. anymore. So the new singers, but Jeff Duff's helped out too. But um, uh, and it, 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 they started out by doing a, a tribute to Led Zeppelin. Now the singer sounded like Led, you know Robert Plant, so it got a lot of streams. Then they went on and did a Glenn Hughes and Trapeze tribute, and then they started writing their own material and going out that way. Anyway, we were looking at the uh, Led Zeppelin because that gets most of it. Not not a lot of people know Glenn Hughes and Trapeze, and and uh, you know. On Spotify, you know, they, I think their top song had 14,500 streams. But on YouTube Music, their top stream, I think the Immigrant Song, had 109,000 streams. Now, it's wildly different there for mm. two, two platforms, one representing 70% of the market here anyway, and the other one, YouTube Music, probably 5%. Anyway, um, there were some really wildly different stats before them. Now, we figure the correlation there being that they'd gotten a lot of streams on YouTube for those songs, mm. YouTube video, and that, you know, YouTube are pr cross promoting, which you would expect on their YouTube channel if there's a correlation there. Because uh, not everybody would have a, an audio out, they may only have the video out. Uh, so, mm. We we were analysing that yesterday, and they were far more popular on YouTube Music than they were on Spotify. So we're going to investigate that and do a bit more investigation, and I will come back to that. I mean, I'm putting in posts on YouTube Community now. I always put in the post itself, um, stream on YouTube Music, because you would figure they won't squash that because it's their own platform. Yeah, the linking of all the, I mean, YouTube within itself, you'd think there wouldn't be an issue. But I'd still, would be wonderful if Facebook would let you just drop in a YouTube clip that would play instead of you having to click on a link. 
you know, you think they're making enough money not to worry about. No, yeah, you know you've got to put that, you've got to load that video up onto Facebook. Yeah, we, we've talked about it so many yeah. times. But yeah, you've got, you know, you've got to, it, it doesn't matter what we talk about, they, that's what they're doing, they're all in competition, they're all not allowing cross-pollination, right? So yeah. that, You've got to take that original clip that you've uploaded to, you've got to go back to your source clip is what you're saying. Go yes, back to your source clip and load on it your hard drive. Yeah. And then upload it to Facebook separately. Exactly. Or yeah, exactly. Upload it to Insta separately or upload it. Well, if to you go to Facebook, you can if you're using Facebook business, you'll be able to upload it to Instagram and Facebook at the same time. Yeah. And it yeah, will well. repurpose it and do all your comments and all that and uh, put all your description and all that in there. Um, otherwise, yes, off. you do what you said, do it separately. Yeah. 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 So, but on the, yeah. um, you were talking about the Led Zeppelin covers that um, the band is Re, the band is Remora. Um, yeah, yeah. And if Remora you listen to it, uh, it's sensational. That's why they're getting so many streams. Well, streams for yeah. A I've cover, got a couple of cover band Led Zeppelin covers up on my um, YouTube Shorts. Yeah. So I have the lots of Zeppelin play alongs. But we used to the soldiers used to do a killer version. Of Heartbreaker, I've got a live version of that. I'm not sure whether you've heard that. I should send that to you. And there's another one that I was talking to Gib, the singer from the Soldiers, about. I'd like to release through you as well as our version of Dog Eat Dog, which is just killer. Who did ACDC? Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Well, you know, look. Those, as I said, so in community, what I'm doing is I, I put now in the post itself. You know, stream on YouTube. You might as well get something. You would think they're not going to hold that back. And then, obviously, in the comments, then you've always got to put clicking comments to stream and yeah. go down in the comments and do that. It's a lot of hard work when you go across all platforms. Um, and you, you know, and I know that you, Rob, are across all platforms across you know community threads, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Yeah. And TikTok. Uh, yeah, yeah, and a, a little bit with TikTok. I'm sort of uh, sussing that as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a big job doing that, and we do it three times a day, so you can imagine how much work goes in. And then, you know, you need to repurpose 60-second videos. And you need yeah. to have them in box one by one, or you do them in um, uh, vertical, so uh, yep. 9 by 16. <laughs> and um, so a lot of work. And then having yeah, to is. put those stream links in comments oh god it's another job you know it's big cut and paste big, exactly. well yeah you know <laughs> well, well the the trick of it rob is that you've got to do it quickly um so as that goes up we we know from our stats now on layway red as soon as we put up a facebook post i'm not kidding it's within about 15 20 seconds we've got mm. people clink, clicking on those links within 15 yep. so that means when i put the post up because I can't have the comment up before the post. I've got to get quickly into the comments and get the the streaming link in there to capture those people. You got me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's hard, you know. It's you yeah. know, you're working at a rate of knots. You really don't don't talk to me. Don't disturb me. I've got to quickly get to the comments. And if you're going to do a couple of streaming sites, so you might do Laneway Red and you might do Spotify. You know. It, it takes, you know, let's call it a minute or two, and you've already probably had twenty clicks on the on the post. Yeah, right. So you've got to work really quickly. Um, uh, you know, I hope that's coming across, and uh, we and we can see it because we're tracking all this now. Yeah, right. Um, in Laneway Red, you will, as you put your music up, you will have links, uh, media share links to every platform. So there's a lot in there, and we have sub subdomain links, which are really important for the sites that don't allow the box to come up. They just leave the link in there, and they don't bring up the picture of the link itself. I don't know if okay. that makes sense, but yeah, if, does, yeah, yeah. So so we have subdomain links too. So we we've kind of covered all angles for people, and uh, it's really important. You have to work at a rate or not. So um, mm. it's all really good news. I think that we're getting closer towards understanding that, those stats to the benefit of the artist and to try and break artists because, you know, again, I get a lot of comments about, you know, thanking us that if it wasn't for Laneway Music, 
uh, a lot of these uh, heritage artists and more mature artists would have nowhere to go but band camp themselves or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of those kind of sites. And, yeah. um, you know, then they've got to do it all themselves. On top of that, they've got to create the music, which is a, a tall, tall order. So, you know, we I get that all the time. And, you know, I for, for example, there's a post from Phil Manning, uh, you know, Australia's premier blues guitarist. Yeah. And... Um, I was begging him to do this song, Cane Fields Burning on his 12-string guitar because he's done a couple of acoustic songs and they have gone crazy on our Facebook. One's got a quarter of a million views and a couple wow, of thousand that. likes and, you know, yeah. like a thousand shares. The other one, I think, had 50,000, um, yeah, 50,000 views and a thousand likes and, you know, on it goes and 700 shares or something. Anyway, doing really well. And then you, I put up the next, so I might put up, um, you know, look, I might put up Virgin Soldiers and it gets five likes and, you know, 384 views. But, but what, are we, what are we doing that for? Well, you know, and I, or I might put up the Angels, which, you know, would go crazy, and then we put up Virgin Soldiers straight after. We're trying to tap into that audience for our bands like Virgin Soldiers or, um, you know, I don't know, other bands of ours, you know, Southbound Snake Charmers or whatever. We're, we're trying to tap into that audience for you, the artist, yep. to grow yep. grow that and capture that that audience. So, you know, it's really, there's a method to everything we're doing. And some, you know, I had, I had one particular person who was having a bit of a chuckle, you know, looking at a few of the Facebook posts, go, oh, look, you're only getting five and ten likes and 300 views. And, and then I go, well, why don't we have a look at some of the big ones then? You know, and he quietly shut up after that. Um, and a guy that was being a little bit condescending, you know, and I thought, well, mate, you know, have you got 32,000 followers, genuine followers on your Facebook and 43,000 on your YouTube? We're, we're building. We're trying to build. And we're trying to build yep. honestly and organically so that yep. they are genuine followers, not just purchased followers. I could go on a real rampage financially and I could build those followers really quickly, but they wouldn't be committed. That's the problem, um, you know. Uh, you know, and yeah. so anyway, there, there's enough on that. Um, so, you know, so we've all got, you know, what's good to hear, you've got product coming out with Virgin Soldiers and with, uh, uh, you know, contributing Michael towards Michael Hill's um, yep. Yep. Uh, release and whatever. And I look forward to... Yeah, we've got to, a gig coming up too, which is good. Are you, uh, and and which, with, with which band? With the Grouse. Oh, uh, yep. Okay. Which is Mike, Michael Hill's the singer in that band. But, yeah, I mean, we're doing our own original stuff in that, Michael's stuff, my stuff. Um, so, yeah, that's good. Fantastic. I mean, mate, it's great. Look, I, I wish I could do more live shows myself, but unfortunately nothing, it's just not possible. I, you know, I've committed to, I've committed to all the artists, Rob, like yourself. And mm. unfortunately it does take away any commitment I can have to playing myself because, you know, I've got artists, um, you know, hitting me up for stuff every day and I've got a commitment to them. You know, yeah, and yeah. that's the commitment I've taken. So, yeah, um, sure. yeah, I'm looking forward to your material coming out. Anyway, all right. Well, let's yeah. say we're under an hour. Uh, we're just under an hour. So, is that enough yeah. for today? I would think. Too, well, I reckon right? that's great. Right. Oh, there's plenty more. Look, plenty more. I've been a bit uh, slammed for the last couple of weeks, but uh, yep. plenty more to come. We'll see everybody or talk to everybody next week. And yep. uh, it's been good chatting to you, Rob. You too, Vince. No worries. Talk to you next week. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.